my last video, I talked about procedural tools and putting those together in thoughtful ways to make some interesting generative art. And while this may sound fairly simple, there are some fundamentals to doing this. So for this discussion, I'll be covering some of those key aspects of generative systems design and generative art creation that I focus on when coming up with my own designs in art. In generative art design, there are several fundamentals that inform the design and creative process. So for anyone who's just starting out making generative art, let's take a look at some of the more important aspects that are involved in that process. I'll start with what is arguably one of the most important aspects of generative systems design, location. Art is typically expressed through the use of dimension, whether it's a one-dimensional line, a two-dimensional plane, three-dimensional volume, a single moment, or within a dimension of time, art requires some environment in which it can be expressed. To begin, let's look at art expressed in one dimension of space and one dimension of time. Now this may sound complicated, but all we're really talking about here is numbers along a line that we'll call the x-axis. In an extremely simple generative system, we'll be using a placeholder called a variable. We're going to use it to assign a value that may change over time. So if this were a movie, each frame of the movie would be one instant of time with a run of film being our dimension of time. The scene in the movie would be described by a single point, which will be the value of the placeholder that's pointing to the location on the line that we've called the x-axis. That's pretty straightforward so far. We've identified or assigned to a point the location on a horizontal line. The major part of generative art is assigning a location using some value and adjusting that value to move the point around and, if we like, move other points around as well. The more thoughtful you are about the way your points move, the more interesting and appealing your generative system will likely be. So for our first look, we'll be discussing the aspects of location and movement. There's practically an infinite number of ways that you can locate and move points on a canvas. For the bulk of generative art, these ways are described mathematically using logical procedures, conditions, and operators. And that sounds kind of scary and complicated, and I won't lie, it is. But there are varying degrees of complexity that a willing artist can easily learn to work with in some meaningful degree. Sure, you'll be using algebra, calculus, geometry, and trigonometry. However, you don't really need to know those things specifically to use code and make generative art. Does it help? Yes, it will help tremendously, but the nature of code makes using those things more practical and less abstract. So what you may not have understood in high school or college math, you might understand it better graphically while using the concepts in a practical way. The point is this, don't let math scare you. You can do this. With procedures, those coding tools we'll be using to design generative systems, location is typically described with the horizontal position, the x-axis, a vertical position, the y-axis, a depth position, sometimes represented by scale, and the z-axis, along with changes to position over time. There are a few other ways to refer to these points as well. You'll sometimes see columns representing the x-axis and rows representing the y-axis. The tools for positioning points can be as simple as random changes to x and y, or as complex as derivatives that describe fractals. You can get complex forms to emerge from fairly simple systems, like an L system, for example, so complexity isn't always the key to an interesting generative design. A common but simple tool for positioning points uses a grid to section the canvas into uniform regions. The relationship of the grid positions offers an interesting way to visualize changes to the system, which is a key aspect to generative design. Changes to positions can be constant, where a fixed amount of change is applied to one or more positions, or they can be variable using incrementers, oscillators, and random values, or they can be logarithmically applied using some formula or function. The key to designing a compelling generative system is often the manner in which you make changes to those positions over time, using a combination of constant and variable adjustments. These changes can be informed by input from internal systems, such as a random number generator, some stylistic randomness, or using something like the device's own clock and calendar. They can be influenced by external systems, such as the user, data sources from local files, or the web, or you could use video and or audio input, along with many others. When coming up with the design for a generative system, the hardest part might be getting those points, these locations, to change in an interesting way. Fortunately, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
There are many procedures already made that are basically just the graph of some movement, from bouncing objects, flocking behaviors, tangential recursive orbits, targeted linear interpolation, Perlin noise, Brownian motion, Levi flight, path following, spring systems, sinusoidal oscillators, and many, many more. The toolbox is already full of fascinating ways to move points around a canvas. While many of these are pretty simple, others are fairly complicated and require an entire complex of code just to generate a movement of some kind. And this is okay, you can use simple movers or complex ones or mix and match. That's what's so exciting about designing generative systems. You might discover a new way of moving things around that others would enjoy using as a tool for their own generative systems or you can use for future projects. Particle systems for the generative artist are kind of like water to the watercolorist. It's a vital component you see so much that you can almost forget how critical of a component it is. The term particle system might sound scientific or complicated, but it's really just a fancy way of saying a group of like things. When designing a single object of any sort, a generative artist is thinking about that object as a particle system, this group of things that may have subtle or obvious variances that depict some relationship that emerges from the quantity of those things all acting together. Each particle can function independently or interact with the other things in its system of things. One popular example of this is using the distance of things to initiate some action. The procedures for comparing one object in the system of objects to any other object in that system isn't an immediately simple thing to learn. It has some nuances that you'll discover while using it. Just like with practical art, the techniques may sound straightforward, but implementing them will take some practice and conceptual effort to use with confidence. There are many tools like this where practice will make a huge difference in not only how capable you are at using the tool, but also at identifying cases and procedures where the tool would work perfectly. Not all generative art, but a significant portion, makes use of particle systems. They're the first step in modeling some idea, concept, or platonic system using procedures and computer code. Nature is arguably a set of generative systems, so modeling nature, or actual things, is a common theme in generative art. Algorithmic art pioneer Manfred Moore first explored coding as a means of modeling his own style of art using a computer. This brings us to another key system of generative art, which is the modeling of real or imagined systems. Generative art doesn't limit you to one model at a time. You can combine models into never-before-seen things. And that's really exciting. I think that's what compels so many generative artists to see what they can get the procedures to describe. Developing an idea for a generative system could be as simple as just walking around your home or neighborhood, looking for groups of things that change or collections of different things that interact. You don't have to perfectly duplicate what you see. Just try to identify some of the more salient procedures involved and code your system to model that. Particle systems can give you lots of locations with lots of movement and interaction, both deliberate and emergent. Deliberate locations, movements, and interactions are those that are pretty much set by the code in terms of predictability. This could be locations tied to a grid or movement that's one directional or conditions that test distance for causing some interaction. The emergent locations, movements, and interactions are those that are harder or impossible to predict just like the movement of a double pendulum, the landscape of Perl and noise randomness, or the interaction using steering procedures along complex and dynamic paths. The emergent properties of the output can be combined with deliberate properties to create something that's compelling and demonstrative of the power and distinctiveness of the medium. It's the sheer numbers, the lightning speed, and exquisite accuracy of code that opens up endless possibilities for expression to any artist that's willing to learn how it's done. A set of procedures working within a generative system can produce a single output or output that's constantly changing. Of the single output, it can be variable, such as each single output is different. Of the constantly changing output, it can change in a way that's always the same. Generative art seems to have built into it these paradoxical contradictions that make it really compelling. Having an animated system that produces constantly changing output that is of a single repetitious quality can be as appealing as the purely controlled unpredictability of a three-body system. George Nees, a pioneer of generative art, 
explored the nature of order and chaos with his work Gravel Stones. In it, Knees uses uniformly positioned boxes of a uniform size. Each box is generated with a tiny amount of uncertainty injected into the system, so that the boxes tend to be less organized as they continue down the space in a grid-like pattern. This ends with the boxes completely disorganized and scrambled in a chaotic, yet contradictory manner that's cohesive to the uniformity from which the chaos emerged. The simplicity of the outputs balanced by the complexity that emerges from the chaos over time. From a static output, this single image, we can sense the repetition playing out in a dimension of time that is simply implied by the end result. This aspect of generative art lets us balance order and chaos across dimensions of space and time, through color, texture, and form, and by means of pattern, structure, and movement, providing an unimaginably diverse medium for expression. A line or a path is a graph of a point's movement over time, and by moving the point, we've abstracted it into another form of which the point is a critical component, but not the most obvious one. As a line, we can graph a plane, which is an abstraction of the line that creates the plane. And convolutions of abstractions are an important part of generative art, as it's been traditionally described. Although in modern times, generative art is more specific in some cases, with no abstraction of form or structure. In these cases, the concrete expression is the focus, like making cartoon characters with randomized attributes. For the purposes of this discussion, and more importantly this point, I'll be using examples of generative art that are more abstract in their intention. These could be deliberate concrete forms, but they're being used in a way that balances abstraction and concretion. Through the movement of some defined form, we can get an abstract form that takes on completely different properties from the form which created it. It becomes less obvious how the form or texture or movement was created because those components have been abstracted into obscurity. This aspect of generative design means that tools that produce some rudimentary concrete form can be methodically altered into some abstract form that's far more compelling than the thing that originated it. The point here is that something might seem discountably simple, but its abstracted form could be amazingly compelling and interesting. As with any artistic medium, there's a mainstream aesthetic that informs the fundamentals of design. These expectations form the basis for how an artist will formulate the design for an expression so that it aligns well with the audience's sensibilities. There are outliers that test the bounds of this relationship, but by and large, we can expect that certain values will be relatively adhered to when designing art. The same is true for generative art. I've touched on a couple of these fundamentals, such as repetition with the example of particle systems and movement with the example of procedural tools like sinusoidal oscillators. Ben Kovac and Tyler Hobbs offer more details regarding the use of design fundamentals in the development of generative systems, and I'd encourage you to look up those lectures and maybe check those out if you want to learn more about that. For now, I'll briefly discuss how each of the design fundamentals might apply to the case of a generative system. There are three fundamentals that could be addressed through the creative use of generative color systems. Just like procedures that move objects through locational or movement patterns, color systems use code to move through locations within channels or properties of color to produce color patterns. The procedures for acquiring color schemes can be just as evolved as those for positioning and moving particle systems. Because of the control an artist has over the color palette, its scheme, its changes over time, and its patterns, Generative systems are extremely versatile in terms of developing balance and alignment in the output, along with contrast, simply with the clever use of color. These three fundamentals also apply to the graphic and textural components as well, so thoughtfully synergizing the color, texture, and geometry output can play a major role in maintaining balance, alignment, and contrast fundamentals in your work. Controlling the population and concentration of output over time is another aspect of generative design that uses the fundamentals of design as a guide to applying those concepts in your generative systems as well. Proportion is another fundamental that generative systems are well suited for. The scale of an object is easily manipulated with code. This offers the artist a degree of depth, an analog for inheriting properties, distributing particles for balance, weighing, sorting, and much more. Recursions are a methodical way of proportioning objects, dimensions, color, time, movement, and other properties of a generative system. 
With creative attenuation of distribution and scale to the output, the weight of the overall work can easily be balanced in a way that recognizes the fundamentals of proportion in design. Contrast can be achieved through movement and color as well. The way output is displayed over time offers a lot of possibilities, so staying within the confines of design fundamentals is a great way to stay out of the weeds where there's less meaningful output. Adhering to the fundamentals of contrast in design has its challenges, but there truly is so much variability that can be studied rather quickly that making adjustments to contrast, movement, position, and color will likely become an intuitive process for the average artist. You'll see a lot of output that isn't very interesting, but with enough adjustment you'll begin to hone in on that space and output where everything is nearly perfect. How much of the canvas that's not being used at all or the frequency that some output occurs in a given region will describe the white space of your generative output. The objects in the system are generally constrained by some condition or set of conditions out of which can emerge patches or regions of less attraction. A thoughtful distribution of these patches will make your generative output more compelling. Generative systems provide a way of exploiting emergent patterns that can affect the way contrast and white space influences your design. Again, running the code and fine-tuning the variables is analogous to adding shadow and highlights to your painting. An artist can work quickly to produce a quality work, or they can fiddle and make minute adjustments over months or even years to reach a state of perfection in their design. There are many other ways that the fundamentals of design can be applied to generative systems in the output they create, making these another key aspect to generative design. The more comfortable you are with interpreting the fundamentals of design, the better able you'll be at making decisions about code and procedures necessary to achieve your generative system design goals. With all this in mind, it's easy to understand why computers and graphics have been so perfectly married together with code. The ease and flexibility an artist has in terms of designing something unique, compelling, makes generative art an attractive medium for people of all ages and technical ability. Beautiful, meaningful art can come out of the simplest procedures put together in a clever or imaginative way. With just a little bit of technical understanding, an artist can express something amazing and valuable both extrinsically and intrinsically. While these aspects are not a complete description of everything associated with generative design, they're the stepping stones that will help carry you into the world of generative art. Once inside, you'll be better prepared to make the most of your time and effort while having fun and enjoying the creative process, which is really what it's all about. I hope I've been able to help shed some light on the subject and dispel any anxiety or doubts you might have about being able to use generative systems as an expressive medium. Many of the things that we do today are fairly complex and involve several steps to accomplish, but we easily power through those things because we aren't intimidated by them. We simply accept that we can do them when we learn the steps. Generative art is very much one of those things that involves steps you can learn. Put those steps together and you have something really awesome to share. This brings me to my final point. Of the billions of people on planet Earth, only a relative handful use code to create art. As an interdisciplinary multimedia materials artist, I can tell you that personally I find watercolor far more difficult than designing generative systems. I believe it's because I never looked at coding as something that I couldn't learn to do, just like sketching, just like painting, just like sculpting. If you're the kind of artist that loves variety and working with different media, then you've got to give generative art a try. In my next video, I'll be discussing how to get started coding, along with some of the key things to keep in mind when working with code to make generative art. Thanks so much for watching. I truly appreciate your support. Please leave a comment, share your experiences or what concerns you about becoming a generative artist. If you've subscribed, thank you for coming along for the ride and my coding adventures. If you haven't subscribed yet, I'd be honored by earning your subscription. So if you like this content, hit subscribe, hit the bell to be notified every time a new video is released. And as always, until next time, take care.